For ten thousand years, the Lady of Pain has silently ruled the city of Sigil. Master the full hub of the portal network, despite the petty wars of the gods. The city of Sigil is the largest metropolis in the Astral Sea, untold millions making sacrifices to sustain it and ensure the continued survival of their people in face of a hostile multiverse. From hundreds of crystal spheres, teeming with the clueless and monsters, refugees and oppressors alike, come to find their place in a larger galaxy, to find treasure, fame, and fortune amongst the plains. Beset on all sides by foes of such malice it would sear a man's soul, but to know a fraction of their blasphemies, only the strongest and most ruthless survive. Foes from within and without seek to overthrow the Lady's rule, throwing themselves on the throne of blades in vain efforts to destroy, in a moment, the eons of her rule. The Great Devourer comes from the far realm beyond the Astral Sea, driven to consume all before it, surge from their barbaric empires to pillage and slaughter. The vengeful Eldarin cite prophetic visions as they raid and destroy even their own cousins, and an ancient evil arises from tombs sealed at the dawn of creation. In the grim darkness of the Great Wheel, there is only war. I, I understood that reference. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Paul Schur, a graphic designer, once said that the greatest innovations in the history of mankind were done by people who had no idea what they were doing. That might have been half-jokingly said, but I think history bears it out. Some ideas that seem crazy at first end up being significantly less so when all is said and done. My favorite Chan board, TG, has a history of doing exactly that with ideas that prompt the response of, that's a dumb idea, let's do it anyways. This brings us to the game that, in my opinion, is the ultimate expression of TG, Dungeons the Dragoning, a combination of aspects from 7th C, D&D, Planescape, World of Darkness, Exalted, and Warhammer 40,000, all based on a dare in the words of the author. How does it hold up? Let's find out. Because it's a mix of games previously covered or hinted at, Dungeons the Dragoning will have some familiar aspects to its design, if slightly different in context of the system that they're in. We'll be exploring this with a hedge knight of sorts named Nimbus. The first step is starting characteristics and skills. This works similar to how it did in the Storyteller system, wherein you allocate 6 points to the primary, 4 in the secondary, and 2 in the tertiary. Regardless, no ability can have more than 4 points invested in it. In our case, we'll go with Physical as our primary, Mental as secondary, and Social as tertiary. After assigning the points to each, we arrive at the following. Intelligence 1, Wisdom 2, Willpower 4, Strength 4, Dexterity 2, Constitution 3, Charisma 1, Fellowship 1, and Composure 3. Skills, much like characteristics, are split by primary, secondary, and tertiary, but this spread doesn't have to be the same as that of characteristics. The primary group gains 8 points, the secondary 6, and the tertiary 4. No skill can have more than 3 points assigned. So in our case, we'll go with physical, mental, and social again. And our skill spread is common lore 3, perception 3, acrobatics 2, Athletics 1, Brawl 2, Weaponry 3, and Scrutiny 2. Step 2 is Race. Of the races we have to pick from, we'll go with the Eldaran. This grants us a plus 1 to Intelligence, Academic Lore, and the Warp Step power, which grants a per-scene teleport at short range. Step 3 is Exaltation, the heroic spark that grants supernatural or extra-normal power that characters bring to bear. This grants a set of exalted powers and a type of resource. In our case, we'll go with Paragon. This grants the starting Paragon powers, a plus one to intelligence, three pressure points, and the action point resource. Step four is class. Despite the name, the classes here are more akin to careers in Warhammer Fantasy, as this will determine where you may spend your experience on skills, feats, and so on. In our case, we'll go with Swordsman, which determines the possible skills, characteristics, feats, 
and in our case, sword skills that we can spend experience on. Step five is background, which works similarly to backgrounds in the storyteller's system. You have eight points to spend on backgrounds, and no single background can be worth more than three. We'll spend three on artifact to reflect his ancestral spear, three on wealth, and two on followers. Step six is alignment, a particular deity or pantheon that you have some connection with. This also ties into our devotion, which is six by default. In our case, we'll go with Bahamut. Step seven is experience, the personalization of the character sheet. We have 600 XP to start on our initial purchases. We'll spend 100 each on the Action Hero asset, as well as the Melee Weapon Proficiency and the Medium Armor Proficiency feats, as well as two Special Attacks and 200 on Rank 1 in the Ironheart Discipline. The final step is Equipment. We have one of five packages to choose from, and we'll go with the Earth package in this case. This means we start with a Hand Weapon, Auto Pistol, Las Gun, Knife, Flak Jacket, Uniform, and Rations. Since we also have the Artifact 3 background, we have an Auriculum Spear, the ancestral weapon that we spent that background on. Character creation is a bit of jumping around, but not excessively so. I do think the cost on creating special attacks racks up a bit too much for my liking. Additionally, I'm not the biggest fan of the equipment package as it's presented, as I think it could stand to be a little more freeform or pick and choose. That said, the game's creation holds together extremely well, given the varying material that they're drawing from. Dungeons of the Dragoning uses the Roll and Keep system seen in Legend of the Five Rings and Seventh Sea. The formula for these rolls is XKY, wherein you roll X dice, typically the sum of characteristic plus skill, and keep Y dice equal to the aforementioned characteristic, the sum of the kept dice compared to the action's target number. Whenever 10s are rolled on these die, those rolled die explode and are re-rolled and added to the previous result. And finally, any multiple of 5 over or under the, t the target number is considered a raise or a check, respectively, allowing for extra effects to be applied to the result. Sometimes an effect will grant what's known as a free raise, which adds a plus 5 to the roll's result. Hero points are the game's extra effort mechanic, and can be used to re-roll a failed test as well as reduce the TN of a roll and several other effects. In addition, you can opt to burn a hero point, much like you could burn a fate point in Warhammer 40,000, permanently reducing your hero points by one to cheat death. Combat is far more akin to Warhammer Fantasy in 40k, with the roll and keep framework. Initiative is a dexterity composure test, and individual turns grant either a full action or two half action. Damage works in a similar fashion where lost hit points in excess of your current total force a critical damage effect, the effect in question being rooted in the type of damage inflicted and the hit location. So those of you who love the Dark Heresy's critical hit charts, well, you've got their equivalent here. In addition to physical combat, Dungeons of the Dragoning utilizes a social combat system. For this, a mirror to hit points and static defense are used, called Resolve and Mental Defense, respectively. However, there is no social damage per se. Instead, you spend Resolve to nullify the social attack. It should be noted that once a specific type of social attack is resisted twice, that particular angle is blocked off. The Roll and Keep system, as presented here, manages to integrate itself with Storyteller's mix of physical and social combat in a way that feels very natural. It does suffer the flaw that often occurs with the system in the skewing towards characteristics over skills, however. While the issue isn't as terrible in other games due to the various means of spending and boosting rolls, it is still there. But we're not quite done, and before we wrap it up, we need to look at the Sublime Way and the Sorceress Way. Dungeons of the Dragoning integrates the controversial Book of Nine Swords into its Sword Schools which, incidentally, would get a ranged sister in the form of Gunkata in one of the expansions. Instead of having a preset school of blade spells like in D&D's take, sword schools are more akin to dominion techniques and anima to an extent. First, you have an adept level, which you need to have, which is bought with XP. The highest level of adept that you can gain is locked to your highest class level. Furthermore, your class determines what sword schools you may access. For example, a swordsman could only access the Iron Heart and White Raven schools. The school in question is key to the true form of the sword schools, 
special attacks. You create special attacks through style points, which operate on a point by system of advantages and restrictions. Your pool of style points is based on your highest leveled sword school, and incidentally your highest level sword school will also be your adept level. These style points can be spent on advantages and restrictions to a standard attack or a different action based on the schools you have, with higher school ranks granting a wider pool of potential effects and also a wider pool of style point. While this grants a great deal of variety on potential attacks, once again my issue is XP expenditure. You have to spend XP on school ranks as well as on special attacks. This could come up as a bit more pricey than it needs to be, and diminishes the freeform potential that the sword styles have in my opinion. Magic, on the other hand, will be much more familiar to those who have played Dark Heresy, as it works similar to the psychic powers in that game. Much like sword schools, your available schools of spells is based on your class, as that determines which spheres of magic you can access, and these spheres have to be bought with XP. Oddly, buying a rank gets you one spell in a school of that level. When casting a spell, you do not expend a resource, but instead make a test based on the spell in question. This is rolled as either a fettered, unfettered, or push casting. A fettered casting rolls half the normal dice, unfettered rolls all of them, and push rolls all as well as adds a bonus to the caster's school rating. On the other hand, unfettered and push run the risk of psychic phenomena occurring after the roll, which operates on a D100 chart. An interesting spin displayed with the magic system is the idea of combos, casting multiple spells in rapid succession. While developing combo spells costs XP, 50 per level of each spell, using the spell proper has caveats. First, the casting uses the lowest characteristics and magic schools. Second, the target number for casting is the highest target number of the component spells, plus 5 for each additional spell beyond the first. While both systems are done very well, I feel like magic is treated a bit more easily than sword schools in this regard. There's also the issue that sword schools association with the classes seems a little restrictive by having only two of each, although this would be expanded in some of the follow-up books. Even so, most of my nitpicks are ones that could easily be addressed with a few house rules. There's been plenty of bashing ideas together, but most of these are relegated to April Fool's jokes. In any other situation, this would just be another case of one of those kind of jokes or do it for the lulls kind of instances. But it's not. Not at all. Dungeons of the Dragoning is a game brimming with potential and the best of each world smashed into it. A true greatest hits of their games, if, it, if you will. While there's some nitpicks I have here and there, it overall provides an experience that I would actually pay money for. And I got this game for free. The fact that a game with this potential is free just raises its stock even further. To that end, Dungeons the Dragoning gets a stamp of strongly recommended. Not only does the game have a strong sense of variety, it hits a nice medium between grimdark and high adventure. After all, in the grim darkness of the Great Wheel, there is only war.